Okay, I suggest we start. First of all, um, I would like to welcome you to the session on non-filtration and disarmament in Northeast Asia. My name is Yelena Sokova. I'm the executive director of the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation. Um, and I also want to thank all of you who braved the cold weather and rain to get to this room, <laughs> remote room. Um, and that, that a big attestment to, to the importance of the issue. And I'm very delighted we have a very uh, excellent panel today that can look at the various aspects of what we're facing on the North Korean Peninsula and in the region itself. Um, if we were having our meeting probably in the spring of this year, the discussion would have been a little bit different. And after much of the hope uh, for, the, for finding some solution and resolution to the North Koreans nuclear program uh, that we had after the Singapore summit and some other developments, we uh, slided uh, back to the a more uh, kind of tense and um, developments, including the resumed tensions between the two countries uh, and uh, new tests by North Korea, uh, still they're still kind of uh, holding on to the self-imposed moratorium on not testing the ICBMs and nuclear weapons. But as we learn almost on a daily, on a weekly basis, the uh, rhetoric is returning, returning up both on the North Korea side and uh, the U.S. Uh, we also are aware of the end of the year. Uh, also self-imposed moratorium by North Korea with regards to some progress uh, in negotiations between the U.S. and North Korea. And uh, we have very little time to see any positive steps in this area. So who knows what kind of Christmas presents uh, Kim Jong-un has uh, in his sleeve. Anyway, uh, we also are facing uh, broader kind of challenges in the region, also related to the North Korea uh, developments and testing, but also with the uh, demands uh, more recently from the United States to uh, both uh, the Republic of Korea and Japan to increase manifold the uh, their contributions to the maintenance of the U.S. forces uh, in the two countries, respectively. So with this background, I think we have a really good opportunity to look at the recent developments in the North Korea's uh, um, um, nuclear and missile capabilities. Uh, on the views from the region, including its uh, neighbors from Japan and the Republic of Korea, on how they view the developments and uh, what kind of positions the countries have and what possible steps could be taken uh, to uh, solve the conundrum. And uh, also, uh, we have a, a representative who works in, in uh, South Korea, but also uh, maybe have a little bit of a uh, unique perspective looking both uh, from the um, regional uh, side, but also from a step back looking from the uh, Russia and other states' um, views on these issues. Uh, we also heard today during the morning session about some of these uh, possibilities of finding maybe normative solution to this issue. I don't know how much we will be addressing that during the panel, but this is also something uh, on, on the table. With uh, that, I'm really, um, really pleased that we have uh, an excellent uh, set of experts to tackle these issues. And let me briefly introduce them before I give them the floor. Um, First, uh, Melissa Hannum, who is the Deputy Director of Open Nuclear 
network at One Earth Future. She also directs uh, its Detail project, or maybe I'm not pronouncing <laughs> it correctly. <laughs> Moise, you'll correct me. She's an expert on uh, weapons of mass destruction and studied North Korea and China's WMD programs for over a decade. She's an expert on open source intelligence, incorporating satellite imagery and other remote sensing data, large data sets, social media, 3D modeling, and um, other open source resources. She focuses on monitoring and verification of international arms control agreements uh, using these open source um, resources. And she's also using this information to examine expert control systems and proliferation finance activities. Melissa is an affiliate of Stanford University's Center for International Security and Cooperation. And in 2018, she was awarded the Paul Olam Grant Fund for being one of the most innovative, inventive scientist, uh, scientific and technical minds working to reduce the threat of nuclear weapons. Um, also to the left from me is Akira Gata, who is currently a visiting professor at the Center for Rulemaking Strategies, Tama University. He's also a lecturer at Io Ioama Gaokin University an adjunct fellow at Pacific Forum and a researcher at the National Security Policy Division of the Foreign Policy Bureau, Ministry of Foreign Affairs mm -hmm. of Japan. He was awarded the Aoi Global Research Award to study at, at the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at Cam Cambridge University in 2016 and was a recipient of the Security Studies Fellowship from the Research Institute for Peace and Security. His research expertise includes economic statescraft in the Indo-Pacific, Japanese security and foreign policies, Japan-U.S. alliance, and international politics in East Asia. To the right immediately is Dae-Yoon Kim. She is a senior advisor for Northeast Asia and nuclear policy at the International Crisis Group and a columnist for the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. Her expertise includes the two Koreas, nuclear non-proliferation arms control, East Asian relations and geopolitics, and U.S. nuclear policy. Uh, her writing have appeared in leading publications, including Foreign Affairs and Foreign Policy. She's a frequent commentator on CNN and BBC and was at the Trump-Kim summits as a CBS News contributor. She's quoted widely on global media, including the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Guardian, Japan Times, Longmer, Yonap News, and, and she's also an associate at the Nuclear Policy in Asia programs at the Carnegie Endowment for, the, for International Peace. And previously was a senior fellow and deputy director of nonproliferation at the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation. <coughs> and uh, finally, to the far right of me is Andrei Lankov, who is director of Career Risk Group and professor Cookman in University. So, um, in uh, 1996 2004, he taught Korean history at the Australian National University, and since 2004, he teaches at Cookmin University, Seoul, uh, and currently professor at the College of Social Studies. He's also director of careerisk.com group. His major research interest is North Korean history and society. His major English language publications on North Korea include From Stalin to Kim Il sung The Formation of North Korea, From Lugus University Press, Crisis in North Korea, The Failure of De-Stalinization, De uh, University of Hawaii Press, North of the DM DMZ, Essays on uh, Daily Life in North Korea, McFarland and Company, the Real North Korea, Oxford University Press, and he also uh, contributed to various uh, news outlets, including Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Financial Times, Newsweek, and so forth. Uh, in 2017, the foreign policy magazine included him into the list of global thinkers. He also, uh, so I think we have a really excellent panel and experts, and without further ado, I will uh, give them the floor in the order that they introduce themselves, and I will uh, appreciate if they keep their remarks to 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Melissa, please go ahead. 
Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate uh, joining this type of forum because I, I used to work in the United States. I don't have as many opportunities to be here, but now that I am based in Vienna, I'm really enjoying uh, having the chance to have more dialogue with, with everyone in the room. Um, because many of the other panelists are uh, going to speak primarily on the relationships that are uh, happening in and around North Korea, I thought that perhaps I could speak a little bit about the nuclear and missile facilities as we know them in the open source and some opportunities that we may have for understanding what is happening um, more easily. Um, <clears throat> one of the most well-known facilities is at Hyongbyon, and this is where North Korea produces plutonium with its five megawatt reactor, as well as uranium uh, using its enrichment facilities. Uh, this, this facility was reportedly on the table for discussions in Hanoi, and that there was a near miss on having a successful agreement around that. Um, while this was perhaps not a perfect deal in the Americans' mind, it would have been a really good deal because it would have effectively capped North Korea's plutonium production because they would not have another place from which to produce it. The, the deal fell apart probably related to other facilities that North Korea has related to uranium production. Um, one of these facilities is rumored to be around Kangsan, and um, some of my colleagues and I have looked at uh, satellite imagery of that location. And while uh, uranium enrichment facilities don't have a signature that would indicate definitively that that is its exclusive use, uh, the facility definitely has characteristics that would lend us to believe that it is an enrichment facility. Um, so while it's a shame that that deal was missed, um, it, it would have left the door open for additional uranium production in North Korea, which uh, apparently was too much for North Korea. There is also rumor of another uranium enrichment facility, which in the open source we have not found yet, uh, although we will always keep looking, I'm sure. Um, the other parts of the, you know, the, the weapons program, which are very challenging, is the actual manufacture and hold storage of warheads. And there's very little known about this in North Korea. So this is one of the facilities that are likely being asked for in a declaration from the American side in which the North Koreans most definitely do not want to share because it would be a target. So having these two counter positions, we have to keep in mind that we need to make North Korea feel secure enough that it can reveal enough information that the Americans feel s secure enough. And then we, we get this sort of chicken and an egg situation. In addition to these nuclear facilities uh, are numerous missile testing facilities. And what we've seen over the past year are quite a bit of advancements in North Korea's missile program, even while there has been a a self-imposed missile moratorium on ICBMs. Uh, what we have seen, and, and effectively, North Korea has tested as many times as it has ever before, uh, tied, I believe, for the most tests in a single year, are short-range missiles. And while these don't get as much attention in the news, these um, KN-23 and uh, missiles have a number of challenges which face South Korea and, um, and its allies in the region. The first of which is that these are solid fuel missiles. So these missiles do not use liquid fuel like we had seen in previous missiles like the Nodong or, or uh, other Scud type missiles, which means they can be launched more quickly. They can be stored, liquid fuel missiles can be stored ahead of time, but um, they're more corrosive to the inside of the missile. So they have less of a shelf life. And, it is a little bit more dangerous, but North Korea has never been opposed to taking on those kinds of risks. Um, but these solid fuel missiles mean that uh, from a perspective of someone who's trying to understand where these missiles are going from a satellite, you have a smaller convoy, they have less restrictions on where they go, uh, you can keep them stored for a longer period of time, and then you can essentially just drive them out on a truck, erect them, and launch them in a much more quick process than you would with a Scud-type missile. 
Um, still more worrisome is like the, the Nodong, it is believed to be nuclear capable. And that doesn't mean it has a warhead, it just means that it could hold a warhead someday if North Korea were to make a warhead um, light enough and small enough to fit on in the, to the payload. And then the third angle, which is very worrisome, is that these missiles uh, have some maneuverability and fly at a low trajectory, which makes it very difficult for THAAD to detect them quickly enough and to intercept them. So there is going to be a lot of concern, even if it's not being displayed publicly, about whether these new missiles are going to pose a very dangerous challenge to South Korea because they will have to be prepared for, one, a missile coming very quickly that their radar might not detect and that it could hold someday a nuclear warhead. So they will have a discrimination problem as well. Making those kinds of decisions in such a short amount of time puts, North, uh, puts South Korea and its allies in a really difficult position. And so while the media and the Trump administration has focused on the ICBMs, these short-range missiles are actually quite worrisome to me. When you launch an ICBM, you absolutely know what's on top of it. It has to be a nuclear warhead or else why were you sending it? So you don't have the same kinds of discrimination problems. And unfortunately, this solid fuel technology that we're seeing in the short-range missiles will likely end up in one of the stages of a long-range missile. So one of the other things we're looking for in the coming year would be tests of um, a space launch vehicle or an ICBM that contains a solid fuel stage of the missile. So if the time runs out and North Korea does indeed decide that it's no longer holding itself to uh, this moratorium, then that is indeed what we are likely to see. Um, another area which I just uh, put out some pieces on the Deteo website um, is uh, that there is enough space in the Hwasong-15, the largest of the ICBMs, to likely hold one or more multiple independent reentry vehicles should they choose to design them. That's not to say that they have them, but it does appear that they either want us to think or they are preparing in the future to build some type of uh, independent reentry vehicle that could fit in that type of payload. We don't know how the throw weight, or we, I do not have a good guess, maybe Mike Elman has a good guess, but I don't have a good guess on how the throw weight of, of those types of missiles might change with a solid fuel motor, but, um, but for now it seems at least possible to hold maybe up to three small independent reentry vehicles. The other area I'm watching for 2020 is the submarine program and the submarine launched ballistic missile or SLBM program of North Korea. These are another area where we're seeing activity around the Shimpo site on satellite imagery. You can see the camouflage netting out, which probably is a, an indicator that something will be relieved from that location in the, the near future. Despite all this terrible news, I do want to say that there are some opportunities for us as a global community, particularly the European Union, to use open source information to try to better understand the situation and prevent the kind of escalation that leaves South Korea and its neighbors guessing at what North Korea is doing. I think one of the things that's really amazing is the investment that Europe has made in the, in the uh, satellite programs and the kinds of data that we are able to receive, including not just the traditional red, green, um, blue data that you would see on your Google map, but also synthetic aperture radar. And so Europe is host to uh, several synthetic aperture radar, which gives us uh, the ability to see through thin coverings, to bounce off the ground, and to even see changes over time. These types of really remarkable technology means that even though today we do not have the political will to move forward with North Korea, we are starting to pull together the tools that will help us be ready when that moment comes so that we can have a concerted and effective uh, method to make all the parties feel secure and safe and understand what is happening. So with that, I'll, I'll turn over to my other esteemed panelists. Thank you, Melissa, for the it's, it's a very useful overview of the uh, capabilities and uh, more recent developments. 
Akira, please. Thank you so much. Um, it's uh, always nice to see familiar faces in uh, different parts of the world. And uh, once again, thank you so much for having me. Uh, first, let me just begin with the usual disclaimer, which is that um, I have a couple of different affiliations within the academia, uh, private sector, and the government. But uh, please note, please note that the views and opinions expressed in my presentation does not necessarily reflect that of any of the institutions that I am affiliated with. Now, with that formality out of the way, I will focus on the following three points in my presentation. Uh, first, I'll quickly talk about what could be characterized as the desensitization of the Japanese public towards the North Korean threat, following years of multiple missile and nuclear tests that has been conducted by North Korea. Second, I will give you the latest updates on changes to Japanese government security policies related to North Korea over the last year or so. Third, I will attempt to speculate what to expect from Japan in 2020. So on the first point, one can argue that the Japanese public has been increasingly desensitized by the North Korean nuclear and missile development. Uh, according to the annual public opinion poll conducted by the Japanese cabinet office, the percentage of Japanese public concerned about North Korea's missile and nuclear issues have fallen drastically over the years. For instance, uh, Japanese people who were concerned about North Korea's missile issues have declined over 20% from 83% in 2017 to 59.9% in 2018. On nuclear issues, the number also declined by around 10%, with 75.3% of the respondents saying that they are concerned in 2017 to just 66.7% concerned in 2018. Now, this annual survey is published in December every year, so we should get the latest number either this week or next week. Um, this, however, doesn't imply that the Japanese people's concern toward North Korea in general has declined. When asked about North Korea's abduction issues, 78.3% uh, answered that they were concerned about this issue in 2017, but this number actually increased to 81.4% in 2018. So Japanese people are increasingly concerned about North Korea's abduction issues, but less afraid about its missile and nuclear threats. On a more anecdotal level, I have also noticed that the reaction of the Japanese media on the television uh, and newspapers, as well as social media reactions such as Facebook and Twitter, immediately after North Korean missile launches, seems much more subdued when compared to the past. Perhaps this is quite understandable given the fact that there has been a total of 14 North Korean missile tests in 2019 alone. It is also worth noting that the sense of desensitization is actually shared among some of the so-called experts in the field as well. In a recent Track 1.5 conference that I took part in, we engaged in a tabletop exercise on a potential North Korean contingency scenario. This scenario presented us with a series of North Korean provocations, including cyber attacks and other kinetic attacks towards ships and islands, but North Korea's missile tests were the least talked about aspect of this scenario. All of this suggests that North Korea's recent announcement that it has conducted a very important test at the satellite launch site last week may not have a notable effect on Japanese public's threat perception towards North Korea due to the factors I've mentioned. Second, in a direct contrast to this desensitization of the Japanese public towards the North Korean threat, the Japanese government's security policy has actually shifted due to North Korea's increased missile capabilities. Let me just introduce three recent examples. First, uh, many Japanese uh, people, oh, sorry. Uh, first, many foreign experts on Japan has actually missed this, but the Japanese cabinet has actually published a document titled Current Assessment of the National Security Strategy last December. While this document is not an official amendment to the Japanese national security strategy per se, it is a de facto minor update, if you will, of the strategy published in 2013. This document notes that while North Korea has engaged in bilateral negotiations of the Korean Peninsula, oh sorry, bilateral negotiation with the United States, and declared its intentions for a complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, 
The Japanese government's official position is that North Korea's stance has not fundamentally changed, and that North Korea is a threat requiring urgent responses. Other defense-related strategic documents that was released recently, such as the National Defense Policy Guidelines for fiscal year of 2019 and beyond, as well as the medium-term defense program for fiscal year 2019 through 2023, both reflect this view laid out in the national security strategy. <coughs> uh, second example, in October of this year, there has been a reporting that the majority party of Japan, the Liberal Democratic Party, is considering the establishment of a new project team within the LDP, with diet members from the Foreign Policy Division and Defense Policy Division that will consider strengthening Japan's missile defense. Among the agenda is the use of UAVs for increasing missile detection and interception capabilities, as well as discussing about Japan obtaining a strike capability to deal with North Korea's missile threat. Third example, the supplementary budget plan for FY year 2019 was proposed to the Liberal Democrat Party just yesterday in Tokyo. In this budget includes a, a portion for the upgraded PAC-3 missile defense system, resulting in this year's Ministry of Defense-related supplementary budget to a total of 420 billion yen. All of these developments show that North Korea's repeated missile tests have resulted in the worst possible outcome for North Korea. The Japanese public has been desensitized, so they are no longer worried about North Korea as much as they did in the past. Yet the actual defense policy of Japan has improved to better deal with North Korea's potential provocations. So my last point, what can we expect from Japan in 2020 and beyond? Well, we would likely see Japan continuing the trend we've seen in 2019. On the domestic front, the Japanese government will incrementally shift its security policy so that it can better respond to potential North Korean contingency. On the foreign policy front, Japan will continue to work closely with the United States and South Korea, uh, thank God for the continuation of Jisomia, uh, and then follow UN Security Council resolution and seek for a complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearize denuclearization of North Korea's WMD and ballistic missiles. On a more speculative point, one potential change in 2020, resulting from the recent announced organizational change in the Japanese government, is the establishment of the new economic division within the National Security Secretariat, which supports the policy making of Japan's National Security Council. This economic division will be created next April in order for Japan to better deal with challenges where security and economic issues converge. This includes cybersecurity issues, uh, telecommunication infrastructure such as 5G, submarine cables, and satellites, emerging and foundational technologies such as artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and robotics, and IP protection measures such as export control and investment screening. There are other issues, other challenges related to economic statecraft that this new division will tackle. So while the direct impetus for creating this new economic division within the National Security Secretariat is unrelated to the North Korean situation, the mandate given to this division suggests that we may see new tools of economic statecraft by Japan that can be applied to North Korea with the cooperation and coordination of like-minded countries. So with that, I think my 10 minutes is just up, so I'll give the floor back to Elena. Thank you, Akira. Um, yeah, that's, that's a very interesting uh, point about some of the merger between or uh, intersection between uh, economic and strategic policy issues. Um, probably would like to hear more about it, but <laughs> I will um, pass now microphone to Do. Please. Thanks so much, Elena, and thank you also uh, to the consortium and EEAS for um, inviting me here to share some views, but also, more importantly, to have an exchange with everybody here in this room, uh, because we really are coming up uh, at a critical juncture when it comes to the Korean Peninsula and Northeast Asia, uh, with North Korea's self-imposed unilateral year-end deadline. Uh, and its threat and warning of an unwelcome Christmas gift if the United States does not pitch a deal that North Korea likes. So uh, I'm really glad that my two co colleagues before me set up the foundation, and I'll zoom out a little bit and discuss um, the issue more in the uh, geopolitical context uh, and the diplomatic context. 
uh, and where we are today and uh, what we, I don't have a crystal ball, but we can try to make some educated guesses on what scenarios could um, play out in the next few weeks until the end of the year. Uh, everybody here knows that North Korea has been escalating uh, rhetoric, um, tensions through military demonstrations like uh, short-range ballistic missile tests. It's um, upping the ante with lots of threats verbally. And I see uh, this type of so-called escalation uh, as having two broad objectives. One is to pressure Washington to, again, pitch a proposal uh, in North Korea's exact terms, the way it wants. Uh, and number two, it also serves as a handy way to lay a foundation uh, to justify future more provocative actions. So if North Korea chooses to take more provocative actions come the end of the year or, or uh, early January, uh, and then North Korea can turn it around and say, well, we warned you. We've publicly warned you this could happen if you do not uh, deliver on your own. Uh, and, and I see North Korea being able to um, increase its pressure and able to demand things like, America, you need to end sanctions first. You need to end all joint military exercises first. And then maybe we can discuss uh, the nuclear issue. And they're basically flipping the script of what used to be in the history of nuclear negotiations. The formula has been broadly, North Korea, you take some meaningful and credible denuclearization steps. It can be one, two, three, however many. You do that, and we will reward you with concessions. Uh, but now North Korea is flipping the script. They're saying, you give me the big concessions. And concessions aren't just the food aid and, and fuel. It's, it's not that anymore. It's big stuff. And then maybe we will consider um, discussing nuclear weapons. And maybe we will consider uh, talking about denuclearization. And I see the reasons why and the motivation behind their ability to, to so-called flip the script, as Americans like to say, uh, is um, because they are, they are conf they're more confident now. And their confidence comes from uh, their increasing technological sophistication of their nuclear weapons. And North Korea, the way they talk and the way they act, they make it sound like they're the new Soviet Union now. Uh, and they're really part of the big boys nuclear club. Uh, and so I think this is why they think they can do this and make such high demands. With the year end deadline coming up, um, what will North Korea do? Again, who knows, crystal ball, but um, I think we could imagine maybe three broad scenarios. Uh, one is to continue existing level of provocations, short range ballistic missile tests. Um, but I, I do uh, worry that they might push the envelope a little bit uh, further uh, by testing satellites. The second scenario, possible scenario, is uh, the year uh, and the deadline passes, North Korea's upset, they feel ignored, rejected, whatever that is. Uh, and they start firing ICBMs and p potentially maybe some nuclear devices. And the third scenario could be a combination of this. Uh, and the third scenario would really be you know, the combination, or maybe one, with the first or just the second, uh, who knows, but also to, to as Kim Jong-un said in his New Year's Day address this year of um, you know, engaging with the international community more, especially with like-minded countries. Uh, so, so countries in the Middle East and of course China and Russia. Uh, you know, so what path will, what scenario might happen, what decision will North Korea take? Um, I suspect it would depend on uh, um, some factors, and I think the key factor would be um, at whatever the time is, in a week, two weeks, in December sometime, North Korea's perception of what America's intentions are and what America's objectives are. And I stress the word perception, because perception is very different, or it can be very different from reality. Uh, and so... You know, we're, we're seeing other things, other movements like uh, North Korea suddenly calling this Korea Workers Party um, <clears throat> uh, plenary committee session uh, at the end of this month. And typically this committee meets uh, typically in April. And this is pretty rare for them to convene this meeting uh, at the end of this month. And so I suspect uh, that at this meeting, Kim Jong-un might um, um, uh, decide more details on what this new path is, because you know they've warned we'll take a new path if, America, you don't meet your, our deadline. Uh, and I suspect that whatever comes out of that meeting uh, will 
be more revealed. I mean, they might go public with it, but I think we might see more um, details of it in Kim Jong Un's uh, New Year's Day address come January 1st. And of course, you know, many of you here know that this New Year's Day address uh, d addresses both domestic policy and foreign policy, and it sets a work plan for his people to accomplish uh, in the new year. Uh, in terms of America's moves uh, here too, uh, what will the United States do? Well, my sense right now, uh, having spoken to uh, many officials in the uh, Trump administration, it, the mood right now seems to be uh, that really all options are on the table, meaning they're prepared for any scenario that's to come. Uh, the good, the bad, and not so good, and the ugly. You know, so so the, they seem to be very prepared. And of course, a lot of us on the outside are concerned, oh, if they do go more provocative, what's going to happen? Is it gonna escalate into another fire and fury? Uh, but my sense is within the U.S. government, it's not as few <laughs> concerned as we are. It's, it's they're more ready, uh, and they're not um, too concerned in the sense that we are in that way. And it's almost expected um, for them. Uh, and so here too, uh, from an American perspective, I, I assume that they will also um, base their decision first on how North Korea reacts. Uh, now the problem is, um, you know. There is technically this um, diplomatic process that's open, but uh, North Korea has, is not interested in nuclear, uh, in working level negotiations, despite Steve Began's best efforts to constantly reach out and say, let's meet, let's meet. Uh, but North Korea is refusing to do that and they only want to meet with uh, President Trump. Uh, and so the challenge right now is, and it's not to play the blame game or point fingers at all, it's just a matter of fact. Uh, and North Korea is, as a matter of fact, not allowing negotiations to function properly. So to put in the time. So we saw that in Stockholm, it was only an eight hour meeting. Uh, and we noticed not just in Stockholm, but also before Hanoi, uh, that the lead negotiator just does not have any room to negotiate. They're in a very tight box and they don't, they're not empowered to really negotiate like a negotiator would do. And the normal process of a lead negotiator talking to their counterpart and then going back to capital and getting the marching orders and guidelines that process, we're not seeing that happen on the North Korea side. Uh, and so, you know, here, you know, when I heard that two North Korean officials will be here, are here right now, I was hoping they would come to the session, but I don't see them in the room because I was hoping they'd come, they can write notes and send it <laughs> to, because my next point was going to be, um, you know, what should we do? And, and I would like to, and I just wish they were in this room, but they're not. Um, but you know, but there are friend, or, um, there are partners of North Korea in this room. So Europeans have, or European friends and colleagues have interlocutors and your own contacts in North Korea. And so I think you know the talking point, not just Europeans but Chinese and Russian, um, should really be uh, to urge North Korea uh, to to really give the direct negotiations a chance. Uh, now I know we can all be skeptical about this, uh, but still. Um, to, to basically say test America directly through face-to-face -face talks instead of from far away, instead of from gauging, trying to guess what America's intentions are by just looking at tweets and by looking at public statements because tweets and public statements, a lot of the practitioners in this room know uh, that public statements have a, a key domestic audience that you also address and it doesn't give the full picture. And so I, you know, I think a good talking point on a more united, so-called united front could be come out to talks, test America through talks, test America by signing an agreement. We all know they can always um, overthrow, you know, cancel the agreement later, but to test America that way and test America through um, the actual implementation uh, of whatever deals that they, they try to make. But, but here again, what's been highlighted in Hanoi, even with Kim Jong-un, every time President Trump said, let's, let's try to do a bit more, let's do, I'll do more too, you, why don't you try to do more too? But uh, Kim Jong-un's response was always, no, I just want Yangbyun for sanctions relief. So again, a tight box. Uh, and what I'm seeing, which is interesting, is um, North Korea under Kim Jong-un, their negotiating style, well, it's a little bit different from his father. Because his father used to have a whole laundry list of asks, and it was a guessing game of what they really want. And at the very end, they'll pocket something, and then we know what they wanted. But with Kim Jong-un, and this is, I saw this with inter-Korean negotiations too, they're very public about what they want at this stage of negotiations. They're public, and it's in a tight box, and say, if you don't give us that, then we're gone. And so this is where it gets tricky and challenging because there's really no room. Uh, and so this is where both sides also have to be more flexible and, and try to look for compromises. But in order to have that discussion and look for opportunities and compromises or possibilities, you have to have an actual negotiation. 
Uh, and so, um, yes, I think I'll just leave it there. And you know, I know I don't want to do this whole doomsday thing because I know there are a lot of colleagues who, very smart ones, who uh, worry about a return to fire and fury, and I'm worried too. Uh, but there are ways that I think we can prevent that. But it really, you know, of course, it has to do with the dynamic and perceptions um, between Washington and Pyongyang in the next few days and weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Dion. Um, but it's uh, just kind of a, to, to add to a, a little bit what you said, but there's still a pretty big pressure on both of the leaders, on the Trump and on Kim uh, Jong-un, uh, with regards to uh, demonstrating some progress. There are different pressures, but nonetheless, um, we'll see how it plays out. Um, Andre, please uh, take the floor. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so thank you first for inviting me. And second, this time I probably would suggest to have a look at bigger picture. After all, I have been dealing with North Korea for 35 years, and you will be surprised how little has changed. Well, in many areas, a great deal of things have changed. But when it comes to nuclear issue, it seems that we are playing the same game for nearly 30 years by now, definitely 25. And the major problem, it's probably the time has come to realize we have to change, maybe not too loudly, not too openly, to change our final goal. Because the only acceptable final outcome, like everybody says, is North Korea denuclearization. Problem is, it's not going to happen. It's an impossible goal. And it's a little bit like saying, you know, I'm a pig farmer, I'm feeding my, working to make sure my pigs will fly one day. And all my business plans are controlled by this great goal. Well, not going to work. A North Korean government believes, and within 10 minutes I have, I have no time to talk about it in detail, but I have written about it maybe hundreds if not thousands of pages, sometimes repeating myself again and again about the reasons. But to be very brief, brief they believe, and I, believe, I, I agree with them, that the nuclear issue is the only guarantee of their own political and maybe physical survival. They saw what happened in Iraq, Ukraine, and above all, Libya. They saw all these events as a proof that promises of the great powers should never be trusted. They saw the fate of the Iranian deal, and it's another reminder that de promises of democracies are especially unreliable because democracies have regime change every four or five years. No amount of pressure will persuade North Koreans to surrender nuclear weapons, because after all, if another half million commoners starved to death, decision makers will not be happy about it. They are not monsters. But survival of their, themselves, their families, their power, their system, which is always can be justified, is far more important than survival of half million farmers in distant provinces. No amount of promises about condominiums on the beach we recently heard from Mr. Trump is going to work, uh, because dead person cannot be rich person. And these people believe, and I believe they are right, that if they surrender nuclear weapons, it's just a question of time before they are dead, or maybe in prison, or maybe toiling, cl cleaning toilets somewhere in the Middle East, because nobody will take them if they run away after regime collapse. Uh, so they, uh, they are fighting for their survival, and you cannot bribe them, you cannot blackmail them, them lo like it or not. And it's time to realize it. I understand it's very difficult for the West, not only for the West, by the way, but for everybody, especially for the United States. Americans can sort of swallow the idea of being under the threat uh, from, say, Russia or China. They cannot accept that a tiny country with per capita GDP of $1,200 is their own admission, basically, a recent admission, which is a roughly level of Bangladesh, the economy science of Mozambique, can keep 
New York City under the constant threat of annihilation. But it's a new world we are in, like it or not. So what I would suggest, it's time to understand that is the only solution should be negotiating arms control deal. Our ideal outcome should be some partial deal, which will include um, freeze or ideally dismantlement of the North Korea nuclear facilities. Right now, by the way, we are in a situation in which such a deal is possible. And North Koreans, they try to negotiate it. Now they will uh, uh, treat us with a wonderful political performance show, first class show. I think that starting from early next year, ICBM will be flying, insults will be exchanged, will be something very colorful. I just imagine how Kim Jong-un will describe President Trump and how President Trump will describe Chairman Kim Jong-un. It will be great fun to watch. Uh, but they still believe that we are probably have an opportunity. We have a pres U.S. president who can basically accept such a deal. Of course, when I'm talking about arms control, but what is important? Again, uh, North Koreans don't trust the outside world, but the outside world has even less reasons to trust North Koreans. So it should not be about some nice pieces of papers from both sides. The ideally, uh, if such a deal is done, we should, we should not talk only about promises, note about uh, monitors and observers which can be kicked out at any time. Ideally, should be exchange of concessions they are looking for. Now they seriously worry about sanctions because sanctions are not undermining the economy, but sanctions have stopped economic growth. North Korea began to grow fast, very fast. For the first five years of Kim Jong-un was a time of minor economic miracle in North Korea. I was pretty much surprised when I was last year in Pyongyang after a few years of being unable to be there. city has changed a lot. And then don't tell me it's only Pyongyang. It's largely Pyongyang, but not only Pyongyang. The gap is big and growing, but still between Pyongyang and countryside. They want to resume this economic growth because they understand that in the long run, they are doomed without economic growth. In the short run, they are doomed without nukes. It's better to survive 10 years first to start thinking about 25 years. So they badly need sanctions relief. And they would like to have some kind of uh, political concessions. Uh, but, and they really badly need it, which gives us opportunity to demand a lot in return, which I believe, above all, hardware. Destruction of the known uh, nuclear facilities, the more, the better. Finally, unfortunately, understand that uh, the deal I'm talking about, the denuclearization deal, so the arms control deal, is extremely difficult to sell, with good reasons. If it's accepted openly and explicitly, it will be a massive blow to the existent non-proliferation regime. On top of that, due to this and many other reasons, uh, especially American Congress and American public, and this is the most important part because such things are decided, like it or not, in Washington, D.C., to a very large extent, will have serious problems with accepting and swallowing such a deal. Therefore, I think that probably uh, it will have to be sort of implicit deal. It should not be explicitly said that North Korea is a nuclear power and nothing can be done about it. Even if it's a hard fact, nobody can do about, anything about it. When I say so, people say he's arguing about, you know, in favor of North Korea being nuclear. Even though I repeating, you know, 10 years ago, I wrote an article, published article, I wrote a bit longer, uh, which was called Why the U.S. Lengthy title will eventually accept North Korea as a nuclear country. Have nothing changed since, since this? Yes, as I have said, this very repetitive picture. You see the same repetition, you can recycle what you wrote 25 years ago very often. There's very little changes. Uh, because you have this pendulum between engagement, pressure, engagement, pressure, going every three or four or five years, producing zero results. North Koreans are working hard to develop more and more nuclear weapons, and they are not going to stop. The only thing is, which, if only we change our goals, there are some reasons. But as I have said, it's impossible to accept it or to admit it openly, so probably some kind of ostensibly denuclearization agreement will work. So what I'm saying, Let's start keep talking about denuclearization with full understanding that what we have will, are going to achieve in the foreseeable future should be some nuclear control and partial disarmament deal, which will have to be presented officially packaged as a part 
as a first step towards the great eventual goal of denuclearization, with tacit understanding that the second step is unlikely and the third step is not going to happen, and according to a nice roadmap, we need 10 more steps. So it's how it's probably going to sell. I understand what I have said now is probably not going to be acceptable, especially in Washington, D.C., and it's pretty sad because otherwise we probably will have another 25 years of the same, and in 25 years, North Koreans will have nuclear potential of pretty large scale and pretty high efficiency. Yeah, it's end of my 10 minutes. Thank you all the panelists to uh, really sticking to the <laughs> time limits. Um, and uh, Andrei, I, uh, I'm well aware that your views uh, about the impossibility of uh, having a deal that includes full realization is shared by many other experts, in, including, including in the US. I, uh, two things. Can I do two remarks? Because sure. I saved 25 seconds. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, so first, you know, sort of personal, when I began to say so around 2005, I was seen as a maverick. A maverick, strange, strange, bizarre, eccentric, this Russian pessimist. In 2010, some people began to say that I represent a minority view. Now it's somewhere between mainstream and consensus. And but the problem is, I talk to a lot of people, including practitioners, um, and what I see, people understand it. But the problem is, if you come to the United States or other concerned areas, if you talk to people, say, level of an ambassador, department head maybe, um, uh, maybe a, a assistant undersecretary, something like that, they understand. But it's a nuclear issue. It's a deadly serious issue, literally. So decisions are made two steps up, and it's very difficult I'm not sure whether people on the sufficiently high level understand it. Because for them, they are not even foreign policy specialists, usually. <laughs> it's, it's one of the problem. Yes, expert community, practitioners everywhere, and academia, uh, intelligence, intel community, military across all countries concerned, they understand it. But the decision makers are two or three tiers up. And do they understand? I'm skeptical. Well, I already see a number of placards going up, uh, and um, just want to uh, remind everybody when you take the floor, please introduce yourself and try to uh, be short in your questions so that we have uh, more, more room for additional questions and uh, for the discussion. Uh, Carlo, I saw your placard first, please. Thank you. I'm Carlo Trezza, Instituto Affari Internazionali in Rome. Uh, well, first of all, I was happily surprised that uh, two DPRK representatives were invited, which I think is a positive uh, decision. It's strange that they are not uh, around this table, <coughs> but, uh, but in any case, the gesture was there, right? Um, <coughs> but, uh, I think that uh, there is a window of opportunity which was uh, opened by, I would say, the new uh, uh, Republic of Korea president, Moon Jae-in, opening to the DPRK. And I'm very much uh, afraid that uh, this window of opportunity is, uh, is being wasted to a certain extent. Uh, there are two levels of the situation. One is uh, the uh, dialogue between the two Koreas, and the other one is the dialogue between the United States and the DPRK. As far as the second is concerned, uh, there is no tangible result, uh, with the exception, in my view, of the, of the declaration of uh, uh, in Singapore of, of last year, where Strangely enough, uh, the main deal was a denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, if I'm not wrong, not of the DPRK, and security assurances, on, on the other hand, I guess, by the United States. Now, I think that on the side of denuclearization, something has been done in the sense that uh, 
I understand that the nuclear testing site has been actually destroyed by uh, the DPRK, probably irreversible, if I'm not sure. But in any case, <laughs> we saw some, some explosions and some journalists being there. And uh, also no testing of ICBMs. So, so and uh, the proposal to close uh, Yongbyang. Um, on the side of uh, security assurances, I, we don't hear about it. We don't know what, what it means. And uh, I think no progress has been made. Strangely enough, in Singapore, they didn't speak about reduction of sanctions, which is, which is I think, a core issue which was absent for, from that arrangement. Now, uh, whereas on the bilateral side between the two uh, Koreas, uh, there have been very positive developments, uh, in particular this military-to-military -military, uh, understanding, which I understand has uh, even a legally binding meeting and uh, meaning. So, so my concern is that, and I'm not going to elaborate, uh, is that uh, that the bilateral will be jeopardized by the no the fact that there are no progress on the by, uh, on the dialogue between the United States and uh, and DPRK and therefore that the whole process may collapse. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo. Um, I think Jane. Gina, sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question. Um, the first, first goes to Melissa. Well, um, I understand that North Korea's recent SRBM is a is a big threat to South Korea because it can possibly penetrate the current uh, missile system in South Korea. But I'm more concerned about the mass production of the new missile. I, when I monitor the strategic trade between the DPRK and the rest of the world, I could see that North Korea lost so many partners, trading partners, when it comes to strategic trade. But still, I believe that North Korea can possibly uh, mass produce the SRBM, but not in the near future, but um, in, in the long run. So I would like to hear your thoughts about this issue. And uh, Duyan, uh, your scenario two and, and three actually includes North Korea's ICBM test. But, um, and, and considering North Korea's rhetoric yesterday, actually North Korea seems to be very much determined to do something. But I'm still wondering, um, provocation by definition is disturbing the status quo in order to gain, a, in, in order to have some political gain that should be the purpose of any provocation. What do you think is the pol political gain that North Korea can get from this ICBM test in the near future? And uh, Professor Lankov, uh, according to Melissa's presentation, you know, opening up the Yongbyon facility entirely, that was what was uh, suggested at the Hanoi summit, right? Um, that was a very uh, major concession, I think, on the DPRK side, right? But um, uh, I, so I'm, I'm very confused. What do you think, why do you think uh, North Korea actually put disclosing all the Yongbyon facility on the table at the Hanoi summit if North Korea was, on the other hand, was determined to keep that you know, capability? Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Um, I'll go to, uh, first to the very end of the. Thank you. My name is Sean Ho from the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, RSIs in Singapore. Uh, thank you to all four panelists for excellent, thought-provoking presentations. And thank you to the organizers as well for putting together such a great panel. I have two quick questions. First question to all the panelists. Why is there this year-end deadline? Um, of course, it's an educated guess as to what the North Koreans are thinking. But I think if you could share some of your thoughts as to why they came out with this specific year-end deadline, it may help us understand a bit more of their thinking. The second question is between North Korea and US, the only agreement that they have was signed in Singapore. What do you think from that Singapore joint agreement can be salvaged? Because if we were to go back to the basics, um, that might be a bit helpful. Thank you. 
Thank you. What I will do probably, um, I'll give the panelists time to address some of these questions because there are many good questions and then we'll take another round of questions if you uh, agree. Um, there were some specific questions to the different panelists. Maybe we'll, what I will do is uh, just go around the table and they pick up the ones that were relevant for them. Melissa, do you want to go first? Sure. So to Gina Kim's question on uh, North Korea's uh, recent SRBM, sort of short-range missile tests uh, and mass production, um, I don't have a perfect measure for whether they are indeed mass producing them. You're studying the, the trade channels. Um, I've been studying the satellite imagery of the chemical facilities around Hamhung. So those facilities we can see have greatly expanded. This is where we believe they're producing the solid fuel missiles. And Kim Jong-un has visited this site several times. So we have ground photos from the propaganda as well as satellite images of those places. So I, I can't say that the KN-23s are being, you know, built there, but they sure are, you know, building facilities capable of producing a lot of chemical um, uh, the chemical precursors and, and gels needed for the um, solid fuel there. And that's one of the indicators I've been watching. Um, the other thing that's worth watching are the trucks that will be used as uh, launchers. So um, watching um, both the tracked ve vehicles and the wheeled vehicle production. And so a lot of times I find myself searching for anything to do with large equipment for farming, trucks, tractors, so on, uh, and tank tank facilities um, as places that could produce these kinds of vehicles. And Kim Jong-un has visited a couple of those as well. Um, uh, I think you also asked a question to Duyan that I wanted to answer about the political gain of the uh, ICBM launch. And um, it, this crosses with uh, Mr. Ho's question too. Um, uh, I, I have to admit, I'm a technical person, so I see things through a technical lens more than a diplomatic lens, but I think North Korea is ready to test a long-range missile, and the deadline is convenient because it means that once the deadline is broken, then they can say it was not, it was not their fault, and they are ready. So I, I do think that, you know, there may be some, po there are, there's a political message, obviously, with it as well, but I think technically they may be ready to, to, to test a stage that's solid-fueled. Melissa, maybe you could also tackle one of the comments regarding what the destruction of the nuclear test site is. Yeah, sure. So um, I think um, with the nuclear test site, um, it's complicated. Uh, so we don't have on the ground um, view of, of what happened there. There were reporters there, so we saw that there were explosions at the entrances of those tunnels and there was smoke and that kind of thing. I, I really wish the CTBTO had been allowed to go there and witness that with their sensing equipment. Um, I think that because they were not allowed, that is a big indicator that North Korea does not intend to give up its nuclear weapons. Um, they showed a diagram with three sets of explosions down each tunnel, the ones that had been used and had not been used, all except for the very first tunnel, which had been closed long ago because of, I think, of a radiation problem. Um, if it's just the tunnel entrance, then I guess you, you couldn't eliminate the possibility that they wouldn't just have to dig out that plug at the front. But if they did all three, and to my knowledge, the CTBTO couldn't pick up explosions that small because it was just a, a regular chemical detonation explosion to know whether they did it all the way down the tunnel. There is one tunnel that was never used that we expected them to use um, someday. Um, that's not the only way to test nuclear weapons, so I hate to open this door, but the other thing they could do is test them atmospherically or underwater or you know, on the tip of a missile. So I hope that doesn't happen, but that, that construction, that preparation would be a lot less time consuming than digging a giant tunnel. So uh, we would have a little bit less notice for that kind of a thing. Uh, I don't think they would do that because it is so, so tense. Uh, it would be very hard for the neighbors to understand, especially an atmospheric test. But um, 
but uh, there's other ways to test. And just as we saw last week with the engine test at Sohei, you know, theoretically they dismantled the testing stand for the engine there, but they're already testing um, a missile engine last week. So, yeah, it's back on. Just to add that to that is the, they also uh, at this point have uh, pretty good data from the previous tests. And they can, uh, with the current uh, computer technologies, um, quite a bit could be done without resuming testing. But um, uh, uh, then, uh, would you like to answer any of the questions, provide your input? Uh, sure. I mean, I don't think any questions were particularly addressed to yeah, me. So I'll just pick up. Uh, yeah, I'll guess I'll pick up Sean's question on uh, where this year and deadline. There we go. <clears throat> um, from a diplomatic lens, um, one can only speculate, right? Um, I do agree with Melissa that North Koreans do try to make the case that they follow rules and international law, even when it's, they're in clear violation of them. Um, so I think what's important for the rest of us is to make sure that uh, we are not swayed by North Korea's rhetoric and that we respond accordingly to whatever they do. Thank you. Um, do you want? Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, for, briefly to Car um, to Carlo, your concern about the the bilateral relationship between the two Koreas being jeopardized by the U.S. North Korea challenges, uh, I don't think you have to be worried because it's it's gone, it's it's dead anyway right now. The two the re the two Koreas, a dialogue channel, um, died in Hanoi, and North Korea has cut South Korea out of this entire process, uh, and North Korea is not is not willing to talk to South Korea at all. Uh, so it's really, it's, it's not necessarily that the U.S.-North Korea challenge is causing the other. It, it, it's, it's not necessarily that way. Um, for to Gina's question, uh, so, you know, and I, just to piggyback, piggyback on what Melissa said, one, of course, you know, the technological reason to perfect their technology, um, and, you know, because they also have their national objective to become this uh, nuclear power, or they think they already are, but, you know, clearly they, they have rooms to develop the, the actual technological front. Um, but also, you know, on the political side, uh, clearly to, to provoke the United States to piss America off, um, to show its might, to show that it really is part of the uh, nuclear club, uh, and for prestige um, and uh, standing, both internationally and domestically, to show their own people that they are um, big and powerful and mighty as the way they always try to talk about themselves to be. Uh, and so I see uh, multiple objectives, but the caveat here is, you know, yeah, it, it does clearly sound like they are prepared to do an ICBM, but the political motivations for actually doing it in the new year, it's questionable. And and even though they, they threaten and they have, they, you know, they're, they're talking, ta talking tough right now, the, I, I, I wonder what Beijing might be saying or not saying in private to them. Uh, my question that I always have is, is or will Beijing give North Korea a warning of, you know, you really shouldn't go the ICBM route because that makes, that puts us in a difficult position too. And I also, I'm curious if Beijing would even tell uh, North Korea, don't do the satellite route either because that might put it, that could put us in a, diff because of the UN Security Council resolutions that Beijing supported. Now for satellite launches, Beijing can always spin it and say, oh, those are peaceful tests. But, and so I, these are um, variables that, I, that I'm curious about too. Um, and so, but, and the other thing is whether um, Trump has or will in private or through another letter or tweet or something, give like reinforce his so-called red line of an ICBM. And if, and if Trump directly tells Kim, if even if diplomacy breaks down and you still test an ICBM, that's still my red line and you're dead, then, then if, that, if that registers in Kim Jong-un's mind of maybe I really shouldn't go that route, even though diplomacy might fail. So, so a lot of questions, and I don't have a clear answer, but, but I think these are things that we have to look out for. Uh, and I know I have some very smart colleagues who predict that they will fire an ICBM no matter what, but I, th I still think there's a lot of variables and, and many different factors um, here. I think, oh, what from Singapore can be salvaged? Sean, so um, I think, I'll, Every, all the others can, the other three points can, besides denuclearization. But the problem is North Korea is not interested in doing that right now, and we saw that in Hanoi. So before the actual Hanoi summit, the working level discussions, they agreed upon basically everything else except for the nuclear part, and they said, 
I cannot talk about nuclear, only Chairman Kim can talk about nuclear, and so that's what the whole Hanoi summit was supposed to do. Uh, and so and at this um, juncture, you know, even with Washington having um, presented and proposed and trying to revisit some of the other things, like whether it's liaison offices and other, other more modest things and symbolic things you can do on the building the relationship side, um, it seems like North Korea just isn't interested in that right now. Thank you, Andre. Yeah, uh, Kim Chinan's question about um, um, why were they ready to surrender uh, Yongbyon? Uh, basically, right now they have two programs. One is all plutonium program, which was essentially launched in the middle 1960s. <coughs> Sorry and produce the first nuclear device in 2006. And on top of that, they have highly enriched HEU, highly enriched uranium program, which was launched at some point in the 1990s and uh, produced some of more recent devices. Uh, HEU program is much more difficult to control and trace because for plutonium program, you need a nuclear reactor, which is impossible to hide. Right now, North Koreans understand that they need to sacrifice something. And predictably enough, like a lizard, with, which is, when it's been pursued, it's sacrificing its nice, beautiful, very good tail to stay alive. Uh, for them, obviously, Yonbyon, which is key for plutonium program, was this part of tail, which could be basically jettisoned to get few things Above all, obviously in Hanoi, they wanted to have sanctions lifted. Maybe, we don't know, I have heard so many stories of what has happened in Hanoi from many sources who I normally would consider to be trustworthy, but these stories contradict one another. Uh, so basically, I don't know, but looks like that North Korean side expected that the U.S., actually Donald Trump, would, ex would ex uh, basically accept such a deal and was a big mistake. But what they wanted, they wanted to sacrifice the least valuable and outdated, still not insignificant, not trivial, but least valuable and outdated part of their program to keep a more modern and much easier to hide part of their program, that is HEU program, which would remain not completely untouched, because they have a HEU facility in Yonbyon, but they have a large number of facilities across the country, not of which are known, and that anyway, they were not on negotiations in Hanoi. So my understanding is to get through sanctions with full understanding that they should not wait until the next president, who probably will be more difficult to de de deal uh, with compared to Donald Trump. They were willing to sacrifice, uh, to give something in exchange of getting something from the United States. And they believe that would be a, f a good deal for them to, uh, to swap Yonbyon for sanctions relief. Personally, I believe that Americans were probably right in not accepting this deal because Yonbyon was too cheap a price for sanctions relief. They would, would mean that North Koreans would lose, say, 50, 60 percent of their nuclear de uh, device uh, production cap manufacturing capability, keeping, say, 40, 50 percent. They would keep their entire delivery system production capability. They will keep all their nuclear devices, and Americans would instantly lose all leverage, 100 percent. So it was something like exchanging 100 percent for 40 or 30 percent altogether. Not a good deal, not a fair deal. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Um, we have more questions, and I will uh, first go to Alan, then uh, you, and um, uh, Mr. Ma, and then uh, Michael. Okay. And over you. Uh, thank you. Alan Ware from Parliamentarians for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament. And I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is for Ms. Dion Kim. Uh, and it's based on some of the points that, that uh, Mr. Lunkov made, which I agree with many of the points, but not the final conclusion. Uh, the points I agree with that there are key issues, security issues, of why uh, DPRK is holding on to the nuclear weapons and will continue to do so. But I disagree with the conclusion because I believe if those security issues are met, then there is a possibility of getting a nuclear-free Northeast Asia. Um, but the question then comes back to... Um, as Kim, is that 
In your talk, you mentioned about the importance of flexibility on both sides in the US DPRK negotiations, but then your appeal was mostly to the DPRK. What are some of the concessions that the US could make, and particularly on the security and economic issues, which are important to DPRK, that might help move the process forward? Is that, for example, feasible that the US could agree to moving ahead uh, with DPRK on an, a declaration to end war, which is one of the steps for increasing the uh, meeting the security issues? Uh, is there the possibility of discussing um, the proposal for Northeast Asia nuclear weapon-free zone, because the nuclear weapon-free zone includes uh, security assurances? And there was a, a, an event on this in Seoul just two weeks ago run by the Diplomatic Academy, which is exploring the feasibility of a Northeast Asian nuclear weapon-free zone. And what incremental measures on sanctions uh, could be released in order to assist with some of the uh, economic development? And then the second question, and this is um, for both Ms. Kim and Mr. Lunkov, is on the inter-Korean process. Um, and it seems to me that the inter-Korean process was on three elements, political, economic, and social cultural. And it does seem that the political and economic has been stalled, uh, and that's somewhat understandable because there's been no room to move on that um, with the uh, lack of uh, progress on the US DPRK on the political side and the so sanctions regime. Uh, so it's understandable why North Korea may not be speaking and talking about those issues at the moment, but they are still discussing the cultural and social issues. And I know this because I met with the Korean head of the International of uh, the Olympic Committee uh, just two days ago, um, and they are in the discussions, for example, of the joint North Korean South Korean teams for the winter uh, for the next Olympics, the Tokyo Olympics. They've basically got four teams that they're going to be fielding, not one this time. So there are discussions on that, for example, you know, on the on the cultural side. Um, but I think it's, it's true that the other um, discussions have been stymied because of the lack of progress from the USDPRK side. Uh, Tarek Haider, I'm uh, with the National Defense University. Uh, I was in uh, Seoul for four years as ambassador at the same time as Ambassador Carlos Reza. Uh, I just have two small observations. One is um, in terms of uh, Ms. Melissa Hanham's uh, thing on the uranium uh, location of the uranium plants. As far as I remember, Siegfried Heckler, who I've met, had written extensively on his first visit, uh, being the first uh, Western scientist to visit uh, one of these facilities. I'm not sure why it's a problem to locate that or to cite it. The other thing is a more general comment, and that is that uh, one of the key issues here is to provide North Korea with a sense of security. And then uh, at the end, which you know people seem to lose track of despite the 94 agreement, et cetera, is what is the end game that uh, at least uh, the countries there would like to aim for? And I think there's a paradox there. South Korea is quite ambivalent about moving towards some kind of reunification. They, they have periods like the Sunshine Policy where they're more towards it and then less so, et cetera. Uh, the United States is worried that if there was such a move in the future, the South Koreans may bargain away the American troops there. The Chinese are worried that if there was such a move, U.S. troops would move closer to them. Uh, the Russians are also worried for the same reason. And I think in Japan there's been a sort of atavistic feeling that uh, if both uh, uh, Koreas were unified, it would be an extremely strong competitor. So I think there are these paradoxes, uh, which, of course, the North Koreans would not be oblivious to. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ma? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name, my, uh, I'm Ma seung -hui. I'm from the Chinese Foreign Ministry. As for the uh, position of China, I think it is known to, to everybody here. I will uh, not repeat to save time. I, when we discuss the, uh, the, the, the Korean uh, nuclear issue, I have two words in my mind, uh, at least two, especially at this moment. One is security. As uh, some colleagues uh, mentioned, this is a very important word we have to rem remember when we discuss the uh, denuclearization of the peninsula. Uh, of course, the security should be uh, uh, offered to all parties involved. 
But according to my uh, personal assessment, DPRK is now in greater need of a kind of sense of security or security in its real sense. Because for such a small, small country on this peninsula, compared with the number one superpower in the world, together with its military allies, I think it's logical to see that DPRK is in urgent need or greater need of a kind of, of uh, security. I wonder, given the, given the current stalemate, whether the US or its allies could go a step further or more proactively to offer some kind of security assurance to the DPRK to settle or to solve the stalemate at this stage. Because uh, as for the, uh, the contents of the security assurance, it's up to uh, discussion or to, to negotiation. But I think this is very, very important. At least it can be a kind of uh, incentive for the DPRK to, to do something more. Of course, if, if the DPRK thinks that U US is trustworthy, of course. The second word I want to mention is development. DPRK is not in bad need or need badly development. Uh, in this regard, DPRK faces the serious sanctions arising from the uh, UN Security Council resolution. I wonder at this moment, at the current stage, whether the United States could go a, a bit, uh, go a step further or to show some concessions to the DPRK to allow or to agree to the, uh, the, the lifting of sanctions arising from the UN Security Council resolution. I think if that could be the case, the DPRK could have a sense of uh, attunement or kind of the, the, they could be uh, encouraged to do something more. These two words are very, very important when we discuss the DPRK, uh, the, the peninsula's denuclearization issue, either at this moment or in the long term. Fundamentally, I have another question. Uh, another question. If we look at the history of this nuclearization or denuclearization on, on the peninsula, we have seen lots of ups and downs in the past, from the last century. To, to until today, whenever there is a kind of progress, either on the on either part, we see some unexpected happenings, either mishaps or good haps, from another part. Especially, I do not want to criticize anybody here, but especially from the United States. So the question, the, the third question is: Does the United States has the real intention? to realize the denuclearization of this peninsula? This is a fundamental question. This is a question asked for many, many years, many, many decades. So according to your assessment, uh, does the US has uh, such a kind of intention? Thank you. Um, Michael, you're next. Um, <clears throat> yes, thank you, and thank you to all the panelists. Um, um, Gina asked a, a, a very interesting question. Could, could which, you introduce yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm uh, Mike Elliman. I'm from the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Uh, apologies for that. Um, what does North Korea have to gain from resuming testing or, or being more provocative? And I would argue they have quite a bit to gain. Um, and it. it and I'll explain in a second, but it goes to the more fundamental thing. Who's, um, does time play in the favor of North Korea or those that want to see a, a, the, quote, denuclearization of North Korea? And, and I think North Korea is willing to be much more patient, and they're willing to suffer through sanctions a lot longer um, than maybe the, the West or the world is, is <clears throat> ready to apply them. Um, but the, the value in additional provocations is the idea that they could test um, their ICBMs further. Um, they've only tested uh, the most capable system one time. Um, they have no idea whether the system actually works or not. Um, <clears throat> uh, in fact, Van Van Diepen at 38north.org uh, outlined some of the steps that, that North Korea could benefit from testing. 
Um, I think it is in the international interest to make an agreement to freeze that kind of testing. I'd like to see them freeze all missile testing, but I'm not sure that that's realistic. But take the bite at the apple that you can. Um, and, you know, I think the less of a threat they pose to the United States, the more willing the United States is to be flexible, um, but also to ensure the uh, security of its partners in the region, namely South Korea, Japan, and others. Um, so I, I see some real value in that. And, and I go back to um, what Scott Sagan, I think, said two years ago, that you know, North Korea is no longer a nonproliferation challenge, it's a deterrence challenge. And I think he's, he's true, uh, and that's a true statement. He it's accurately portrays the situation today, and it goes to what Professor Lankoff uh, <laughs> mentioned, um, and I wanted to pick up on, on the, that thread. In, in his, what do you think North Korea would be willing to give up in terms of capability? Would they truly be willing to freeze where they're at today? Um, would they eventually put uranium enrichment on the table um, in some verifiable way? I mean, what steps do you think could be achieved in next year to three years um, that the North Koreans would accept and would enhance international security? Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take two last questions. Um, hope, please be brief so that we have time for the panelists to respond to all the questions. Yeah. Thank you to all the panelists and to the discussion. Actually, my questions were already answered, so I just have a really, really small comment. I am Elizabeth So from the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. Um, I understand the technological and technical um, gain that North Korea could could have from flight testing ICBMs, but I don't see um, the political gain either internationally in bargaining with the U.S. nor domestically. Because um, 2020, in uh, response to the Jashan's question, is important for the DPRK um, in at least two domestic reasons, one being the uh, five-year plan being done next year, and the other is the 75-year anniversary of the Workers' Party. So two very big propaganda um, reasons for having 2020 as the big year where something has to happen. And I mean, for the DPRK population, especially when you look at the propaganda that the strategic defense side of the Byongjin line is achieved, the other side needs to be achieved, which is economic growth. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. And you will be the last. Thank you very much indeed. I'm Sandro Knezovic from Croatian Institute for Development and International Affairs. First of all, let me thank the organizers for inviting me here and giving me the privilege to participate in such an esteemed event. I have a question for Mr. Lankov. If hypothetically your concept is accepted and a deal reached with North Koreans, what impact will that have on behavior or character of the regime in place? Having North Korean glasses on, is this a win-win scenario and a strong motive for regional and wider global reintegration? Or is this another proof of mental superiority of their leaders um, and the defeat of the West and the entire international community? In other words, a modus operandi for striking the deals in the future period. Thank you very much. Thank you. All the excellent questions. We'll probably do again the way we did it last time. Melissa, why don't you go first? I think I only had one direct question, and, and that was from Mr. Tariq Haider. Um, the uranium enrichment facility that uh, Sig Hecker saw was at Yongbyon facility, and the reason he found it was because the North Koreans drove him there. The challenge is that all the other enrichment facilities outside of Yongbyon are uh, li have little or no information about them, and because that all of these facilities are essentially just large sort of boxy, warehouse-looking buildings, it's very hard for us to discriminate between what is an enrichment facility and what is just a, a regular warehouse of some kind. They don't produce an unusual electricity or frequency or anything that we can detect really easily. So they are very difficult to find. And as we know from Iran, you can bury them and you can do all kinds of things to, um, to keep them disguised. Um, I did want to take a little bit of a liberty and touch on something that Mike Elman and um, Andre Lankov also said, and, and 
so uh, Andre mentioned that he didn't think taking Yangbian was a good deal, and he had a like a good proportional reason for why that was. But something that Mike and Gina touched on was that the time is in North Korea's favor. That the longer they drag their that we drag our feet, the longer that time they have to develop their nuclear and missile programs. And so I'm in a favor of even if it's not a perfect deal, taking many small deals that would create these sort of stop gaps and freezes before we eventually get to that. So while Yongbyon's definitely not a perfect deal, and as Andre says, it's their oldest technology, it's the oldest parts of their facility, but it would cap plutonium and tritium. So that's not nothing, and we might as well take that good deal, especially if the sanctions or whatever it is we exchange have a like a snapback style to them that can also be reversed. Um, you know, that the, the devil's in the details. But I, I, the larger point is just that I would not shy away from taking many, many small imperfect deals as opposed to waiting for that one big perfect deal, which may never come. Thank you, Melissa. Akira? I'll just uh, quickly address two points. First on Mr. Hyder, um, you mentioned about how Japan may see unified Korea as a competitor. Um, I would go as far to argue that some Japanese security specialists actually see a unified nuclear uh, Korea as a security threat. However, my personal opinion is that there are so much more uh, problems that we have to solve now that the prospect of a nuclear unified Korea should not preclude any uh, solutions that can be taken now. Uh, and lastly, um, um, Mr. Elman, you talked about our, you quoted Scott Sagan, and I think that quote is very apt. Uh, you look at all of the evolution of Japanese security policies that has been taken in the last couple of years, and it's all about increasing how we can increase our deterrence by denial. Thank you. Do Um To Mr. Allen Ware's question, flexibility on both sides, so what can the United States do? So um, I've talked and written about this um, quite extensively on... Um, and I've, I've said this to the Trump administration, too, since last year, uh, last summer, last fall, uh, is, okay, I understand your approach is lots of denuclear, like big denuclearization first, and then we'll think about sanctions relief. But I said, you know, but you have to give them something. You can't just wait that long. Uh, and so what I have been proposing is um, time-bound sanctions exemptions and waivers, not the lifting, but to, to, so exemptions would be like a pause, right? Because if you lift them, you can't put them back in because you have to go vote for them at the UN Security Council, and that's just going to be impossible. Uh, and so, you know, and then I've also suggested you be, perhaps we can start with like um, of the five UN Security Council sanctions they want lifted, maybe start with like textiles or something, give like a one year mm -hmm. exemption in return for whatever, you know. And so, uh, and so the, even in Hanoi, the Yangbyon for sanctions relief route, uh, even there, in, even before, before Hanoi, I was um, saying, you know, explore the exemption and waivers route with mm -hmm. North Korea and not the full lifting. Uh, but it's quite clear, or it seems clear, that North Korea is not interested well, because clearly they know how their economy works better than we do, right? And so they realize that this exemptions and waivers route actually um, is, is a prudent approach for America, but it may not be, clearly it's not something that they want because they want bigger stuff. And so this is where it gets tricky, right? And, um, you know, and I kind of want to jump to what, because it links with what um, Melissa said a moment ago. I do agree with, like, the small, like, lots of smaller deals, but I think the key is really... Um, we can do small deals, but what's the proportionate bargain, right? So what can what can America or what should America give that North Korea would accept? And that's the big question. And in Hanoi, it was a disproportionate bargain. Young Ben for the five sanctions relief, right? Uh, and so this is this is where the game, the trick is. Um, but then to add to that, I would argue that even the small deals that come before. Um, the big one, it still needs to be connected to an overarching framework or an over a comprehensive agreement of what, even if it's a little bit more vague, but still an end state of denuclearization. As long as the smaller deals are connected to the end, then yes, we should go ahead and do with that and go ahead with that. Um, I'll let Andre do the inter-Korean part of, um, about the, the social aspect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because um, I think he'll say something that I will say, so I, I won't repeat. <laughs> um, there was a question about you. Uh, I think it was Mr. Ma. Does the United States have real intention to denuclearize? Um, oh, wait, actually, you said the Korean Peninsula. Well, it depends on which definition that you're using. But um, I would say, yes, America has real intention to um, realize a nuclear-free North Korea because that's where nuclear weapons are. 
Um, and again, this has always been a challenge. And, and for the first time, you know, North Korea is on the radar of an American president's mind, right? It's front and center. Before, it was always on the back burner. <coughs> Excuse me. And so now, the president, for better or for worse, because it's Trump, um, he cares about it. And so this is a real opportunity. And I suspect that, I mean, Kim Jong-un must know, too, he must realize that Trump is the only American president who's willing to, to deal directly with him and give him more than any other American president would ever dream of giving him. But then I imagine it's it's a, a dilemma for Kim, right? Because then that just means he has to give up his nuclear weapons, and that can't be easy to do in like a couple months or a couple weeks, you know. And so this is where we are. Um, and so that's that's again the challenge. Take Scott Mike to Mike's um, point about Scott Scott Sagan, and deterrence challenge. Um, so yeah, I, I agree too. But see, if we look if we look at this broader, you know, the, America has a couple choices, or the Trump administration has a few choices right now. Um, you know, either one, ignore North Korea, two, go maximum pressure on steroids, right, if North Korea provokes at the end of the year or next year, um, or three, con go full-on containment deterrence, or four, um, unfortunately, uh, would be military action, which the Trump administration clearly seems to be comfortable with considering, seriously, you know. And so here, you know, the reason why, and, you know, I, I too, am skeptical too, right, but because there is a diplomatic process open technically, um, you know, the, the reason why the, the negotiated route is better is because at least if you can come to an agreement, uh, you are verifiably limiting their capabilities. Whereas if you go the containment deterrence route, you have you just don't have any eyes and ears of monitoring inside. And so they can still develop their capability if we just go the containment and deterrence route. And of course, I don't even want to go the military route. But um, And so these are... Um, you know, they, they, they really are, and I agree with you, Mike, that time really is on Kim Jong-un's side because he is playing the long game, and he can wait it out even if he does realize that Trump is the only American president to give him big things or bigger things. He, he can still wait it out, and it doesn't matter who else comes next. It doesn't matter if the next president just ignores him or isolates him. He can still, and he's got help from other areas too. Um, and then maybe on the sideline, maybe Mr. Ma, we, I can, we can talk to you because I have a question about Chinese, so we can do that on the side. Thank you. Yeah. I try to keep, uh, to not to keep uh, all participants far away from tea and wonderful pastries. Uh, so I will try to be very, very short. I will uh, start from uh, Alan Weyer's question about social measures. North Koreans don't want to do it. South Koreans are very persistent. They said, we cannot do anything with economy, we cannot say anything military, we cannot say anything political right now because of UN Security Council, because we don't want to annoy Americans. Let's do something on social or cultural exchanges, you know, wonderful stuff, you know, K-pop concert, some uh, uh, academic conference where your scholars, our scholars of history will tell how much we hate Japanese or something like that. Uh, but it doesn't sell. Because from the North Korean point of view, it's not, they are not interested. For North Korea is run by hard-nosed Machiavellians who don't really believe in soft power. And they have little to gain and something to lose from exchanges because it's not in their interest to expose their population to the sides of South Koreans tall, with good skin, and a bit fat. Uh, so, they actually, they do these exchanges as a reward to the North Korea, South Korean government, because they know that South Korean government needs it, not only for the sake of great security, but also because it increases popularity of the right, ruling party just before the elections. So, for the North Koreans, ex such exchanges will be very counterproductive. They will reward uh, a misbehaving South Korean dog. They will reward South Korea, which is not delivering them, give, not giving them money, which is not able to persuade Americans to give necessary concessions, the concessions they consider to be necessary. And if they do social exchanges like divided families, everything, it will increase popularity of Moon Jae-in government, will help him before elections. It's giving present, and North Koreans are not famous for giving presents. So it's not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, because once again, their attitude is different. It's not what they want. They see all these exchanges as slightly dangerous, politica politically slightly dangerous stuff. They have to do it because it's an international kind of convenience. And they do it only when they are rewarded in some other fronts. 
Yeah, it's basically one, and second, basically to everybody, as, as everybody, Mr. Mashin Kuhn, Mr. Mikhail Elman, all everybody asks this question. Mm. Mr. Ma, I hate to say you, but we are in this situation because your representative, Russian representative said, yes, sir. And your representative pushed these sanctions in the UN Security Council between 2016 and 2017 to my personal great and not very pleasant surprise. But anyway, it has happened. <laughs> Big mistake. Anyway, it has, everybody makes mistakes. I'm not, yes, everybody. Uh, so nonetheless, it was, well, China, which is largely responsible for it. Anyway, uh, yes, I do believe that uh, necessary, it, it's necessary to get rid of sanctions stage by stage, piecemeal. They are close and bang, they will not get full release, but they would get, get partial relaxation of sanctions. I would do it in such order. Labor, first to uh, go, seafood, second to go, textile, third, minerals, last. Difference, why? Uh, I'll explain why I don't agree. Uh, ex uh, the major criteria is involvement of private capital in a particular area. How much of the staff is going not to the pocket of the central government, but to the pocket of individual private businesses. Yeah. But anyway, any kind of piecemeal relaxation in exchange of piecemeal meaningful exchanges from ex ex uh, concessions from North Korea will be welcomed. Yeah. And Finally, your question, how it will be presented. Of course, for the domestic audience, it will be presented as another, another triumph of the great Kim family, that another, well, it's no, no doubt about it. Big question, how will they believe if there is such an agreement? They get sanctions relief, they, they destroy some significant part of their facilities, what will they do next? Will they cheat? Definitely. Will they try to secretly develop more nuclear def uh, facilities? Definitely. Question is how much their, of their efforts and resources are they going to commit? If it will be followed by some inclusion of them with, into the more international trade, with some investment, uh, everything coming, probably they will decide that they have enough for their security. So it's, of course they will try to cheat and they will do something, but they will not take it too seriously. They will concentrate on producing, selling stuff overseas, which will make them even richer. And they will, sit, they will be sitting on their nuclear devices, telling everybody they are in the process of denuclearization, which will last for centuries. Uh, but it's an ideal, but can I guarantee it? Definitely not. Because too much is dependent on one person and they are sometimes extremely difficult to deal with. But probability are pretty high to take this way. Thank you. Uh, I had a number of questions to the panelists as well, but we've already almost ate up the entire coffee break, uh, though we have an excuse. We started later. Uh, but I really um, wanted to thank our panelists, first of all, for being uh, really open. Uh, on uh, some and uh, being um, honest in describing certain uh, uh, positions and uh, developments. I think that we got a really good overview of different positions and different uh, uh, points of view on these issues. Uh, it's definitely one of the issues that uh, will continue to keep our attention for quite a bit of time, but I'm sure you are also as appreciative as I am for the expertise and for the uh, uh, points that were shared here with an excellent panelist, all of them. And I really uh, would like if you could join me in thanking them. Um, this was excellent. Thank you all. And thanks to you for your excellent questions and, and comments. <laughs>